Hello everybody and welcome to the Canadian Bowler After Dark. I am your host Daryl Fitzgerald along with my co-host, let's call him the lucky wick to my crappy drive, Luke Caldwell. Luke, how are you doing? Hey, hey. Pretty good, Daryl. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, tonight we are kicking off 2021, I had to get that right, in style. We are bringing to you some legendary bowlers, some past guests, and some great speakers on the game of bowls. And let me do just a quick round table of introductions uh, to my... That way. Oh, no, that way. Dave Anderson. Dave Anderson is uh, a longtime bowler. He is a multi-time Ontario champion. He is a multi-time Canadian champion, international player, international medalist, uh, great commentator on the game of bowls, and we welcome him to the show. Uh, how you doing, Dave? I'm great. Good to see you. And just below him, we have Steve McCarahan, first time to the show, but we are super pumped to have him. Uh, Dave is, I'm going to probably sound like a, uh, a little bit of a broken record, but a multi-time provincial champion, multi-time Canadian champion, uh, international player, long-time uh, national player on a Canadian team, and uh, we just welcome him to the show. Thanks for coming, Steve. Yeah, I'm really, really pumped to be here today. And we'll hop over Luke to go to Jake Shuknik. Jake is a previous uh, guest on both of our shows. Jake works for Bulls Canada. He is the Bulls Development Manager. Hopefully I got that one right. And uh, pretty much everything that comes out of BCB, you're probably correct in guessing he has his fingerprints on there somewhere. Uh, youth champion, uh, longtime bowler. Jake, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be back. It's, it's a fun show. I'm happy to be here. And just above him is Mike Petuli. Uh, Mike is a longtime member of this show. We, we have him on. He's been a great contributor to the Canadian Boulder show, both uh, through this show and offline, uh, discussing things with Luke and myself. Multi-time provincial champion of Saskatchewan, multi-time Canadian champion, uh, member of our, a previous member of our national team. So welcome, Mike, to the show. Thanks for having me. So guys, uh, I hope that your uh, 2021 is starting off fairly well. I know 2020 was a struggle for every single one of us, especially in bowling, since uh, we couldn't do much of it around uh, Canada. Um, I'm going to start this off with Dave. Uh, Dave, what have you been doing in, in your spare time? Drinking a lot of beer. <laughs> That's a pretty good way to spend your, your spare time. <laughs> to be honest, um, yes, drinking a lot of beer, and I, I, I I'm I'm watching the show by the way, and Ryan Stadnick is watching, so he'll he'll like the fact that I drank some some beer while I was off. Uh, I'm working. My, my I, I run a sleep disorders clinic in Toronto, and uh, we're running at half capacity, so six beds at a twelve. So I've been working the whole time. Um, but for the most part, it's, you know, you go to work, you come home, go to sleep, go to work, come home, go to sleep, you know, watch some TV, drink some beer, and that's about it, really. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot. I have two dogs, so I'm walking the dogs, too. Sorry. <laughs> oh, very Dave, nice. it sounds like you're living the life. Oh, it's unbelievable. You have no idea. <laughs> uh, Steve, what have you been doing? I know you've been doing something a little different than previous years. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, uh, 2020 saw absolutely zero balls thrown in competition this year. I actually got onto the green once. I think that was the, <laughs> wow. the total uh, total bowling this year, which is I'll, I'll say is is pretty unusual for me. Um, I retired as of June 26th, so um, I've been living the life, uh, planning on traveling all over the place and lawn bowling all over the place. And of course, none of that happened, but, uh, building things at the cottage, playing a lot of golf. Um, uh, uh, right now I'm down East visiting son Adam and, uh, 
uh, enjoying some time down here in, in the Nova Scotia area. Um, Jake, I know you've been hard at work. What have you been doing uh, there for BCB? Huh. Uh, uh, lots of COVID stuff. So obviously with no events running this year, trying to keep tabs on what every province is doing so we can make protocols so clubs can actually open safely within their province. And of course, none of the provinces actually work together. So every province had something different. So that was kind of frustrating to be honest to try to keep tabs of everything that's going on um but this year was actually really good for me to be able to actually work on projects that i've never had time to before so since there weren't events i could actually focus on like coaching or officiating or long-term development club development um so we're updating like pretty much all of our coaching stuff um i've been working on a club development series to try and help club board members actually run their clubs better so it's been it's been busy it does sound busy, and I know uh, just from dealing with you on a on a regular basis, it has been busy. Uh, another busy guy, uh, Mike. What have you been up to? Just working, day to day, <laughs> same as pretty much same thing. Dave explained. I pretty much wake up, uh, go to work, uh, go downstairs, have a few beers, and go to sleep, <laughs> and do the same thing all over again. Yep. <laughs> awesome. All right, I want to kick off, kick this off since we're we're lucky enough to have both Steve and Dave here. Um, I've been wanting to ask you this for for a little while, but I deal with uh, team building, selection, all that kind of stuff um, on a regular basis. I've been a part of a lot of fours teams. What do you contribute? the longevity of your Forest team over all this time and keeping a core group of players, um, you, Dave, uh, Steve, and Fred, together and being so successful over such a long time? Well, that's... Uh, Beer? <laughs> <laughs> Scotch? <laughs> um I, I guess you know you look back at, at when we got together, and it wasn't it wasn't new for a lot of us to play together, right? Dave and John had played together a long time, and uh, you know Fred and I have grown up together on the greens. So you know we started playing in late '60s with and against each other. So wow. uh, pulling pulling a team together wasn't really that hard because we pretty much knew at least 50% of the team. So it was really pulling two pairs teams together then, as opposed to, to pulling a four team, fours team together. Yeah, it's interesting because um, over the years, John and I have asked uh, different people to play with us in, in, in fours uh, when we had, you know, our team would break up or whatever. And we'd asked Fred before, and I'm pretty sure we asked you once, didn't we, Steve? I think I think we may have asked I'm you sure, once. I'm sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so it, it's kind of interesting that if you look at the previous, say, 10 or 15 years before we actually got together, and, and, uh, and, and here's the trivia question, when did we actually get together? It actually was 2002, but we didn't get a chance to play because I won the singles that year, and the singles in Ontario for the first time ever was uh, first. So as it turned out, we didn't actually play fours, and then Steve... Um, was playing with Greg Steele in the pairs, and he won his second straight pairs team. So Fred was kind of left out, what am I going to do in fours? Um, so we actually officially got together in 2002, but we started to play in 2003. But but prior to that, we'd asked both Steve and Fred, John and I anyway, uh, asked Steve and Fred to, to um, play with us at, at different times. So it's kind of interesting how it evolved to that point. Well, you know, um, if you're Canadian, you know about your guys' force team. And I, I'm just curious. Everybody knows about the, the championships and, and all the fun stuff. Has there any be, been any uh, hiccups or speed bumps along the way? <laughs> you want to answer that one? Or you want me to? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, to, to be honest, 
Um, I, I very few. We're very fortunate, very lucky that we get along often on the green. But there is one that I I, I, I should mention. Uh, we're playing in the gold medal match in, in Edmonton in in was it sixteen against Greg yeah. and his team from Alberta, and Steve had played one side a couple times a little bit narrow, and I didn't say didn't say anything, and then about the say fourteenth or fifteenth or sixteenth end whatever it was near the end I said remember what you did on that side and he turned it looked at me and said I don't want to remember what I did on that side. <laughs> And I went, oops, I think I said the wrong. And usually, <laughs> as Steve said to me afterwards, and we, we talked about it, and it was all good after that. He said, you you rare, you rare, don't say anything negative. You know, even if it's like good bowl or go, go bowl a good bowl, whatever. And and that was negative. And, it, and he, like, the look on his face went, oh, I'll never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. And, so, and there yeah, was a, we- Sorry, one, one more quick story of the same game. I don't know what was going on in that game, but uh, it was very tight. We were we weren't playing our best, but but Greg and his team were also keeping the pressure on us. So it, it was it was one of those kind of games that you're not playing your best, but it's a tight match and, and a good match. And uh, uh, we were lying. We were, we were one in a measure down. Sorry, two and a measure down. Sorry, it was two and a measure down, and. I like to consider myself to be a pretty good vice, but in this case, I was not. And I picked up the bowl and dropped it right back on the jack, and we had to get him, give him a three. And Steve goes down. It was only two. Why, why did we give up three? Well, I dropped the bowl on the jack. And, <laughs> and it was so funny because Jim Roth was in the background watching our game, and he nearly fell off his seat when he saw that because he laughed so hard. Oh, man. So there's there's two negative speed bumps, but like I said, to be honest, we haven't had a lot of speed bumps. Steve may have a different opinion, but that's my opinion. Say, you know, both both in the same game, but you know, the, the that game wasn't unique. It's certainly no. oh. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> but uh yeah, no, we've gone we've gone through uh, ups and downs like any other team. I think I think good teams, you're asking what makes a good team. Um, I think probably what makes a good team is what you do after you've lost. It, it has nothing to do with how well you can win because anybody can win. Um, you know, everybody, every team has their level of, of good bowls and bad bowls. And, uh, and uh, I've been fortunate to play on a team where bad bowls are forgotten quickly and, and good bowls are, are, uh, are rewarded. So, uh, I think that's maybe the biggest thing. Uh, just before we move on uh, from your guys' forest team here, uh, I don't want to gaslight you guys too much, but uh, uh, earlier on an earlier episode of the the After Dark, we actually spoke about what we thought was uh, the greatest uh, forest dynasties in the country, and uh, you guys obviously weren't here to be a part of that. So I was just curious on uh, what your opinion was on that. I think what we came down to was between you guys and the Patuli dynasty. Uh, so I'm I'm just curious on uh, who you guys think is better. Well, Petulis every day, of course. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's a good question. Um, apples and oranges, really, in my books. Uh, I think the Petuli g- g- clan and, and, and those who, who are on board with them, uh, they've done well. I, I, your, your, your victory in, in Willowdale a few years back was unbelievable. You were great the whole week. And... and uh, um, uh, so it, it's. It, I think it's hard to compare. We do we have a. We played. Do we play? I can't remember. Did we play them, Steve? At any time? I don't think we've ever uh, played, we in, played in Nova Scotia. I think. Yep. Yeah, I think before I was around, you guys played them before, in Nova Scotia. Yeah. yeah. Um, Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. Yeah, that was. It's. Uh, I usually remember this. I don't. Don't at the moment. Yeah, it was. It was in Halifax. Uh, the yeah. Whole, yeah. The, oh, five or oh, six. nine. It was an. It was an. It was an even. No, it wasn't oh nine. Around oh nine. Oh, oh eight. Maybe oh eight. <laughs> no, it wasn't oh nine. Nope. Uh, Ten. 11, 12. <laughs> I'll, th- I'll think of it eventually. I know a long uh, time ago. Mar- Marky and Jeff won the pairs. We got the bronze. The gold medal was Pat Bird and Lyle Adams. Um, but I don't remember what year that was. Someone someone will tell us, I'm sure. 
Uh, according but, so, according to so, the chat, uh, 2008 in Halifax would have been the last majors played there. That's yeah. exactly it. Yep, 2008. Okay. We have so, our, um, did you, Jonathan was definitely playing. Nice. Then it was so Mark that Satula. So who, I, I don't remember who he was playing with. Oh. It was Mark Satula with my dad and Alex. Yeah, okay. They probably beat us, right? We don't remember those games. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, so that, to, in my opinion, to answer those questions, it's really, really hard. The, the only thing that, that I might put as a criteria for determining who's, who's the... Uh, the, uh, the better and black it's a bad word but let's use the word better for the moment is maybe just victories that's all but it's hard it's hard to who's a you know, have one you have a team that wins once and they just don't bother play with each other again and they could be the best team ever and I know no no teams like in the 80s from BC that were unbelievable force teams but they never played together again and and you know so they could have won six seven eight Canadian titles if they'd stayed together who knows I was yeah. Just reading the chat there, we got Grant proposing a pay-per-view clash and Ryan saying we should set it up at WOBA. So there we go. WOBA, if, if it works out this year, we'll have a pay-per-view clash and Ooh. see if we can get some uh, money and some hype there behind it. Grant That's Wilkie, nice. is good. It. Yes, and Ryan Stad, I like it. I like it. Um, I'm sure we can I, get a I sports think, book in on that too. Hey, hey, Mike, uh, <laughs> I think we need a little piece of the action. We get a little, ta- a little piece of the take, eh? Of course, we got to get our little take at the gate and everything like that. Free, free, free beer at the bar. That works. <laughs> exactly. So, speaking I like of, these people fact checking us, that's good. I like oh, that. you've, you've got John Seitman in there. He's he's our resident encyclopedia. If we are looking for something, he usually comes in the chat with with some good information. And, and you know. I used to be the guy that they went to for that reason, and he's been better, and I'm very, very jealous. <laughs> uh, hey, Mike, uh, Grant says we should try to get Lucky Logger to sponsor that one. Oh, Lucky. Would be pretty easy. It's got to be Lucky Logger or Boxer, right, Mike? Yeah, no, the, we can't have a classy beer behind us. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, Mark Sanford will be in. He loves Lucky Beer. <laughs> Grant Wilkie's their biggest fan. <laughs> so Jake I want to ask you a question or at least start start you off with a question um, they're speaking of Wobo was brought up in the chat but uh, knowing that 2020 was really no competition whatsoever uh, 2021 who knows um, but before and after that so what was normal before and where we're hopefully going in the future do you think um there's room for more big competitions like a U.S. Open and a WOBA, and is that is that a beneficial way to go for Canada, or is there something else that we need to do to, to start getting eyes on the sport? I think I might be an oddball with my opinions on questions like that, and I've had this discussion with several um, national team members, international members. Um, I, I really do think that uh, we need to have different events here in Canada, shorter events, the way the UBC, the BPL, Bulls 3-5, whatever it is, um, events that are like half an hour, maybe 45 minutes tops that are, you know, quick, exciting, year in, year out, um, because I feel like that's easier to market, that's easier to get spectators, that's easier to get more people interested in playing as opposed to the two and, two and a half hour behemoths where it's 20 to 2 after the first 20 minutes, like, why am I still watching? Um, so I, I think that events need to change drastically to, to actually make a difference otherwise it'll just be the same old same old um but when you're asking about additional events i, I feel especially in ontario um, and ontario is unique compared to everyone else um i think there's probably already too many on the calendar to be blunt between woba and ladies three day in ontario plus all the 20 million playdowns that you already have um i know ontario has the ontario premier league um yeah U.S. Open is great because it's later in the year, so it's, I don't know, October, November, whenever it is, so that's a little bit later. But I think that it's already competition heavy, so I think you would have to either reduce or eliminate some of the playdowns before you introduce a new one, or else it's just going to get lost in the sea of everything else. 
I think uh, what you say about the uh, the Ontario Premier League being uh, something up there. I think the Ontario Premier League uh, definitely has the opportunity uh, to be like that. That uh, if you want to call it like a filler for what we need in the country. I just feel like uh, it would be really great if it's. Uh, if it was sort of like almost like an East and a West or like a conference style, like it is in like NHL or something, because like I've said in the past, like I've been asked to play, but all the uh, OPL stuff is so far away from where I live that the, the opportunity yeah, really isn't worth it. Um, so if there was something on like, say like the East side of the province in the West side of the province or however you want to work it out, I think, I think there could be something there for sure. Well, uh, I'll, I'll try chime in about that the there's been an attempt to have an east and a west in ontario uh part of the problem is uh, well i don't want to really want to talk about the problems because some of them are 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 personal some of them are are global some of them are just the size of ontario it makes it makes it a challenge for sure um i think the ontario premier league could work across the country, well, change it, of course, a national Premier League, and and maybe instead of, a, as Jake said, you know, is the Canadian Championships, is that, that done? Is it, should it should it be going? Is it you know uh, so bring bring something in that that is more appealing to the say younger bowlers or the more competitive bowlers? Uh, it's hard to say. I think the concept of the Premier League could go across the country and perhaps the champions come together as a Canadian Championship as opposed to um, keeping it regional kind of thing. Um, I, I've I've gone back and forth with it. I've, I've sat on the on the fence many times and been very traditional about how bowl should be in Canada um, but I also I see the success when when Premier League is going well it's it's amazing and and the what's it would you say uh, um, Daryl the bowl, bowl three whatever it is in in Australia and even their their um, uh, what's that what's the other one that um, Ryan keeps winning uh, th oh, those are brilliant yeah they're they're you know a half hour games yeah. and you know it depends on what you're trying to do are you trying to develop bowlers are you trying to promote the sport are you trying to figure out who the best bowlers in the country are it's it's hard to say but i think those are definitely ways that that uh, i think the game could improve i think how we do things now um some good stuff but i think we we certainly need to change steve I know you and I talk about this all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you know, marketing the game and playing the game to find maybe the best player or the best team are, are maybe two different things. Um, certainly, certainly the excitement of, of one bowl or one end, you know, making the difference is is uh, usually the case in either way whether you play it short or long it's a matter of in a long game it, you just don't know when it's going to happen um but it's but it's much more difficult to get um somebody who hasn't watched the game to sit there for you know two and a half or three hours to uh to uh to 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 watch one shot and maybe not appreciate it at that point so um yeah i, I think i think there has to be something done to to um to, to shorten things up and make it a little bit more exciting. And uh, certainly things like the, uh, you know, ultimate bowls challenge and, uh, and, and things like that, that they've been, you know, running in, in Australia and New Zealand, it, it, pretty, pretty interesting formats. It's kind of tough too. Cause I'm thinking if not necessarily if we did, but like, I'm just thinking if a, a big event like that happened where games were short, like half an hour, would you actually be willing to fly out to, I don't know, BC or across the country for just a couple of half hour games? And if you end up losing, you're out. Like that doesn't really feel like a good use of money or time to only go for such short games too. So I can definitely appreciate that there's going to be a lot of negativity around shorter events too, because why would I go I mean, so I far from Nova Scotia to BC, right? I suppose right. the question is, Jake, how much money am I winning if I uh, win all of my half hour games? Because if there's lots of money and there's an opportunity, me being a gambling man, why wouldn't I take that chance, I suppose, right? Yeah, sure. sure. I mean, it's, uh, if, if there's a lot of money, I feel like you could say any format is going to be worth it, whether it's a half-hour game or a five-hour game. Like, if the money's there, then the money's there. 
Oh. Yeah, but I, I guess uh, just playing off that point, Jake, if, you're, if uh, we're, we're taking the marketing route, it might be easier to get money if you can fill a TV slot, rather uh, a shorter TV slot than you can something that's long uh, over a longer period of time. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Are we, or we just change the game and we put it on ice and put rings in the middle and... <laughs> oh yeah, they did that. That's called curling, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's just it, right? Yeah, that's right. And and even and even they're trying to shorten their games, right? So, from, I read a fun curling guys. blog that Curling Canada has on their website about how back in like 1930, curling used to be 16 ends and games were like five and a half hours. And so after like the first Olympics, they're like, yeah, no, screw this. This is way too long. Let's shorten it down. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's continually getting shorter. So I, I, I don't see that as a as a trend that we can fight. Probably. Well, I, I agree in, with Steve. Even that... in the time I've been playing, I've played twelve in games. <laughs> I, I was gonna say I, I, I agree with Steve that, that third end. <laughs> uh, finding the best player and marketing the game are completely different. You're not you're not gonna find necessarily the best player in a bunch of half hour games, but in a long game with a bunch of ends and a lot of chances to make uh, either mistakes or really good shots, you're probably going to find the better player. But yeah, it's you're going to find certain people that want to see the long game and, and see that whole giant uh, battle back and forth, and then you're going to find uh, probably the casual uh, viewer, the ones that we're probably trying to pull in, are going to want to watch that half-hour game of drives and exciting stuff going on right yeah it, it really is so tough uh to say what we should do here in the country um just because like a lot of our opinions are uh, um very obviously based off things that we see in australia and uh, they're already so well established that they have the ubc and whatever else that uh, kind of brings on the eyes but then at the same time they also have big events that gets just as much of a following because it's so established where they're playing uh games that are 25 25 up and those games could take however long so i, I think it's really hard to just kind of decide what we need to do based on what, what they're doing yeah yeah certainly they're you know they're their play downs to establish a a national champion or a, or a state champion is you know are longer than what we play yeah you know, there's there's no question about whether you're playing a respot rule or not. You know, you you, you aren't yeah. in those, right? For sure. So, Mike, I want to ask you a question. Do you think there's too many events in Canada, too little events, or are we at the right amount of events going on right now? Personally, I'd say we have too many. Um, we're saturated with events like mixed pairs and even the splitting of the juniors u25s everything like that uh i don't feel like it's completely necessary to have all those events they have their place in club play and sort of your interplay that you could have between even clubs but i i don't really feel like we we need all the championships that we have canada wide because they're expensive uh you really can get some subpar play at a lot of them and if you're wanting to sort of promote the sport i don't see that being your best avenue of essentially creating a second level championship or having to support something like that fair i can say i would love it if there were fewer events it would make my job a heck of a lot easier if i had less <laughs> to manage <laughs> Uh, it, 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 as a national organization, you're trying to appease as many people as possible and having a whole bunch of different national championships accommodates that. And and in an attempt to do that, I think you water it down a little bit. I've, I've always said there's too many ch championships, and I talk mostly in Ontario. You know, we're, 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 we're not blessed with a huge season in terms of length and we only have so many weekends and and you know 10 of them or something like that at the moment i can't think of exactly the number but it's a lot 
the number of weekends that are, are already booked up just with provincial championships. And and uh, we haven't done it yet, but we eliminated the districts for our majors, but it, it really didn't, didn't eliminate the time commitment that it takes to play in provincials because we have so many events. And, you know, Jake, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out the schedule, and just because we had so many provincials, it, it's really hard to to uh, to schedule it in. So, so I think the answer to that question is yes, we have way too many events. What do you guys think the uh, solution for that would be? Like, what do you think is best case scenario if we're going to uh, limit the events? What do you do? Personally, I would go towards a Australian Open type of a Bulls Carnival format if you're going to do something. Uh, have it one long week. Uh, probably have a qualification event that some people could qualify to play in, but then also have some sort of an open event situated around it and just have it as one long week and have everything kind of all rolled in at one. Logistically, that might be a nightmare, I know, but that's probably the best possible solution to eliminate multiple different events all over the place. I feel if you do it all at once, it's going to just get it over with. And then you're probably going to get a lot of people that might be able to play in multiple different ones. So you'll get a, get rid of that crowd that complains about they only get a half hour game or whatever it is. But if you have multiple things going, they might be able to play in multiple events or parts of it. If you were to run something like that, Mike, um, do you think it's possible to run it anywhere outside of Ontario, just assuming you get maximum numbers? Like, suppose we uh, did it in Nova Scotia, would, it, would they be able to accommodate um, maximum people? Or would that just eliminate some of the smaller provinces from being able to host something like that? Wherever you host in Canada, you're going to run into problems with logistics, because depending on where you are, you're going to get people in BC that don't want to spend $900 or whatever it is to fly to the east and vice versa. If you hold it in the west, same thing, Saskatchewan, Ontario, wherever you're going to host it, you're going to run into those problems, um, except for moving it around or hosting it in a central spot every year. But again, you're probably going to get people that aren't going to be too pleasant about repeatedly every year having to go somewhere. So if you were to host something, I'd probably say move it around. But then, as you kind of say, you're going to limit provinces from being able to host. So something like Nova Scotia, I don't know if you get a lot, 100 plus people, if they could support something like that. They have about five, four or five clubs out there. But if they can put something together, that's a good championship. Hard to say. That's a good point. You know, you look at it, look at the open singles for the years that it was on, except for the first year, it became a regional event for the most part. And, and unfortunate. Um, uh, and I think that would happen for any type of Australian open type event, uh, unless there's nothing else. Like you can go provincially having some some events going on keep what they keep what they have but those who aspire to do something bigger and better and it doesn't even have to be national team or international play necessarily just something bigger and if you have a decent pot and and prize money i mean obviously you're you're jumping in for for some uh, a good payday if you happen to win it um but our country is huge that's part of the problem we're we're we have 4,000 miles, give or take, from end to end. And, and and no matter where you have it, you're always going to have someone not going. Look at our Canadian championships. Depending on where it is, some provinces don't always go. And it's you know, mostly east, unfortunately. But but uh, that's the reality of, of the size of our country. So I think, as Mike said, it doesn't matter where you have it, there's always going to be logistical issues. Unless the carrot is big enough and I'm not sure if that's everything, but you know, good conditions of play and and good prize money certainly would bring people in. Uh, where it is might dictate how many. I'm a big fan of Grant's comment there in the chat about what are your thoughts about combining men and women, and like just dropping it and just saying it's a bulls event. It, there isn't a separate men's and women's event. It's just bulls. Oh, don't like that, Laura. I say, do we want to get into that topic oh, right now? Jay? Hang on. Laura, Laura, Fair enough. Laura has a comment here. <laughs> hey, she's more than welcome. She's, she's more than welcome. She's more than welcome yeah. to comment if she would wish to. Did you like it or not like it, Laura? I like it, but there'll be a lot of people who won't like okay. it. Okay, she liked it personally. <laughs> not everyone would like that, uh, but I, it's I, an excellent idea. 
I definitely Brent think Wilkie, it's a, you're thinking out of the box. Well done, sir. I definitely think it's a problem or not a problem, a good idea, but it could turn into a problem um, down all sorts of uh, uh, avenues. I mean, if it worked out um, in a perfect world, I guess if it worked out where um, it was always like 50, 50 split on who was doing as well as the other people, I think you would be okay. But I, I don't know. I don't even know if I want to comment any more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Laura's laughing, so good comment. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just a tough one to comment on. Oh, it's very tough. It is tough, yes. Laura's not wrong. Um, when my club threw out some ideas of doing more open and more stuff like that, um, just because we weren't getting the same uptake in just men's and women's, uh, there were people that said, absolutely not. I will not play with either men or women, and they were just flat. That's it. So it could be a tough sell to some people. Do you guys think, uh, suppose it did go to like a completely open idea like that, do you think that uh, there would be um, solely men's teams and women's teams, or do you think there'd be some pretty dynamic teams where you could have more women than men or more men, when, men with women on their team? Or like, what do you think would happen there? You just have to look at Woba. When Woba went open... There were exclusively men's teams and there were exclusively women's teams and some combinations, of course. And I thought that was great. I think both sides benefited from it. But, of course, there's always someone that says, I don't want to play against women or I don't want to play against men. Um, but I think when Woba went that route, uh, I think it actually was, was a positive thing for Bulls. Yeah, and, and there's really no reason why gender should be you know, a defining factor. You know, there's, you know, from a skill standpoint in the in the game, there's there's really no reason why that you know a man should play a play better or worse than a woman plays in in the game, uh, with maybe one or two exceptions in shot selection that rely on physical strength. But even then, it's not 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 necessarily defined. Good point. That's absolutely true. I would, uh, I would. There's a number of women I would gladly play uh, like front end or or vice versa. There's so many talented bowlers on both sides um, yeah. that I would gladly play with a team full of women and a team full of men, and it wouldn't make a difference. The the question is, does it does it really change the logistics of our events that much? Right. No. No. Not Why really. Not? <laughs> It would be the same. It would still be the same amount of time. You just eliminate the mixed pairs. I mean, I guess you could still have mixed pairs if you wanted, but then I guess it wouldn't really matter because all of the pairs would be open. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's there's all kinds of things that I think thinking outside the box, the way that we're kind of, you know, going now is is something that we really have to do. Um, you know, we we play international events with five people on a team, and split them up in different events, and and so you're only playing one play down. You know, you could combine that with shortening games and and have one play down. Yeah, that that would that would free up a lot of stuff. It would free up a lot of time. Yeah. I think Jake's getting a free focus group here. <laughs> <laughs> this is okay, being recorded, Darryl. right? This it's is being okay, recorded. Daryl, yeah. <laughs> we'll bill Bulls Canada for this uh, this episode. <laughs> uh, along this line, I wanted to, um, to ask you guys and both uh, everybody here, um, I'm really interested. We were talking about how stuff was done in the past and stuff could be done in the future. Um, especially for you, Stephen, Dave, how has Bulls evolved from when you started to what it is today? Are you implying that we've been playing a long time? He's implying no, I'm not implying. Oh, I'm yeah. just stating it right out. So. <laughs> uh, I don't know. My, my first district play down, we had 17 rinks teams play down in our district. Wow, and and back and that's that's back. one of sixteen, and w that wasn't the biggest district. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, that's a huge that's a huge difference. We played straight elimination because of that. 
Um, yeah, just District 5, we would play three games Saturday, three games Sunday, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday was our final for districts. Right. Straight elimination. Yeah, straight elimination. Okay, that's yeah. a huge change, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's, 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 a, that's a pretty big change. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I think maybe part of our problem is it hasn't changed that much. Hmm. We need to... Um, you know, we need to we need to improve um, what we're doing, or else because if we're standing still, we're really going backwards. And I think we've done a lot of standing still. Yeah, I'm trying to think of uh, when I started bowling and the changes that were taking place during that time. It wasn't a lot, and I mean, this is a credit to you, Jake. Um, when I started. And for a long part of my Bulls career, I didn't know anybody at BCB, anybody at OLBA. I didn't know what was going on, who was in the association and doing what. It was really, we kind of let those guys do what they want and we just do what our club wants. Now I think there's a little more transparency at least, but uh, there's probably still a long way to go. Long, long way to go. Let's leave it at that. Yes, yes. I don't want to <laughs> get myself kicked out of bulls. Um, yeah, what's changed? You know, I, to be honest, I mean, I, obviously, I look at it from a competitive bowler's point of view, and and I I can only use Ontario as my example because that's where I bowl. But Jimmy Lee have made a comment back in. 84, 85, and he said the worst thing that ever happened to lawn bowls was, and obviously this is all about high performance and, and national team, but in Ontario back in the 82, 83-ish, somewhere there, they put points on certain tournaments that were points to get you on the national team. So if you got enough points from winning or doing well in specific tournaments you would get a nod for the national team whether that happened or not, i have no idea but you you definitely would get points and and what ended up happening was people who wanted to be on the national team got together with other strong bowlers and would go into these events and then the club bowler club bowler teams would go into the tournament and they'd get smashed and they gave up playing now I'm a firm believer that you've got to go in and, and take your losses before you're going to get better. Um, and, and it might take a while. And I, I lost, I remember losing when I bowled in Montreal, I remember losing games routinely 30 to something because I had no clue what I was doing, but I got better. Thank God. But I think people can only learn by getting beaten badly and, and <laughs> trying to figure it out. Sorry, stop laughing, Steve. It's debatable. Yeah. <laughs> Steve's just saying that he's never lost, so he doesn't know what that's well, like. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, he hasn't lost since night since two thousand and two, and he started playing with me. <laughs> but my point is, my point is, when they started, um, and it's it's the old story of parachuting teams. Uh, it it kind of hurt the game. In a sense, I, and yeah, we're a parachuting team to a certain extent. Although uh, it, we we met the met the criteria for not non parachuting team a bit more than other teams, but uh, the tournaments became kind of irrelevant because it's well, you know, you got the Steve McCarrahan's there, and you got the the Ryan Stadnicks, and you know, you got Wayne Wright, and they all got good teams. What's the point of going into them? So good tournaments, and you look at Burlington. Burlington had to go open to keep it open. Keep yeah. it going, I should say, because the, every year they would be struggling to get a full entry. And, and for the last three, four years, and I could be wrong about how many, they didn't didn't get a full entry. And Burlington was the biggest forwards tournament in the country, really, and maybe the strongest. So that kind of hurt the game, I think, to a certain extent. So we got to – and I'm not saying – I'm not saying – don't have stacked teams, but don't go around with the illusion of being, well, we're not really open, but we're open, that kind of thing. Did I say that right? You understand that point? What? I guess not. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but I went a little bit around in a circle, but Jim Lee have said it. Jim Lee have said it back in the early 80s. He said it hurt the game so much because big tournaments that had full entries didn't get full entries because now these teams were all stacked. That's kind of what I'm saying. 
Okay, yeah. never mind. Bad point. Move on. I, I, I... <laughs> hey, hey, Mike, we better pull our team out of Woba next year, I guess. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, we'll there's too many stack teams in there, guys. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, con- the concept of a stack team, you know, like tell me, tell me that Jimmy Law didn't put people together or, you know, there, yeah, there's like, been teams like that. <laughs> oh, Jimmy Law was a master at doing it. Yeah, uh, he was maybe maybe the best player at forming a team that I've ever seen. So, oh yeah, I think uh, I think putting a team together that's going to succeed, not only on the Bulls screen but together as a group, is should be a worthy goal. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with building a stack team. And if I'm going to be completely honest, I don't think it uh, like, I mean, let's just say 75% of the time. Yeah, it works out. But over my years of playing bowls, I've seen some pretty average players beat some really good teams. So, I mean, <laughs> in, in, in our sport, I don't think it necessarily matters as much as necessarily as people think it is. I think it's yeah. more of like, I think it's more of like a, the wow factor and not wanting to play against those teams than it is actually playing against them and having a chance. Luke, you hit it right on the head. That's exactly yeah. the case. I agree yeah. with that a hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I can say, honestly, for me, one of the, the draws of starting to go into fours competitions and um, being part of the provincials was to play better competition. Like, there was good people out of my club and there was good people out of my district, but once I got out of the district, I would hit, um, you know, Steve's team or the Besters or whatever when I started out. And I would get crushed. I would get absolutely crushed, but it made me come back wanting more because I wanted to say, I'm going to get better. I'm going to eventually beat these guys. And uh, it's not always the mindset of everybody that you want to do that. Sometimes when you get crushed, you're like, I don't want that to happen again, and I'm out of here. Well, you got to think, too, like just uh, going back to our last episode of the podcast, we had John Seitman on, and he made a good point talking about if you want to be better, you got to play against the best. So if my force team goes out there and plays against the best force team, whether I win or lose, I'm going to learn something from that team that's better than my team. Absolutely. That's that's how I learned. I learned by playing against good players and, and getting beaten and eventually getting a little bit better and maybe beating them once in a while. Yeah, for sure. So. I'll throw out this quick story uh, because Steve and, and Dave are here. My first uh, fours with the team, we actually made it to the gold medal game against these guys. Um, and that was when John Devonshire was on the team. Uh, we got creamed in the gold medal game. We were playing really, really well up to that point, but we got absolutely crushed. And then we didn't win the silver and we, we got knocked out. But um, that was a point for me to say, I am, I'm definitely not good enough to beat these guys today. But if I work at it and I get the right team and mindset, I can. And I remember distinctly, Dave came up to me after and he, he put his arm around me and said, if you, if you stop or you don't come back and learn something from this, I'm going to smack you. <laughs> I'm going to give a, just uh, going off that story, I'm going to give a quick shout out to Dave too. Because last year, uh, or not last year, I guess it was 2019 when our yeah, force lost. Uh, Dave Dave gave me the exact same advice. So uh, just a quick shout out to Dave there for being, <laughs> being that guy. And, He's and, and even though at the time people. I want. I say, even though at the time I wanted to tell him to fuck off, I really didn't. Know that, so I could tell that. I could tell that. Yeah. That's part of the reason why I said something, because yeah. those those are the games that define you in a sense. You, you need to to look at those and okay, I got beat by a better team on the day, but what did I? What can I? What can I take from that to to make myself better so that next time it doesn't happen? Hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. No, th- thank you for that. I appreciate that. I, listen, uh, I, I, <laughs> I'm a, as much as I may be personally in competition with everybody, I'm trying to make everyone a little bit better if I can, whether it's my, by my comments or someone else's comments. So it, it, it's uh, it's all good when, when when I hear stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah, to live, throw the Saskatchewan perspective in there, I my Dave Anderson, Steve McCarahan was Keith Roney. So oh, yeah. uh, we went for oh, about no. five years. I think it took me to get to nationals. So I think five straight years of playing fours, pairs, and getting crushed by Keith Roney. You obviously learn. Uh, 
every single time you play and when your team plays together you get better every year so it's a process uh you have to learn from your mistakes and what you do so it's something that comes with time and you do have to play those teams you have to get better so so if you're not going to play them you're going to play someone as good at the nationals so you got to beat them somewhere eventually that's right and the funny I've, thing I've, is, I've often, yeah, I've often said that the that the team that becomes the best is the one that's too stupid to quit, <laughs> and uh, you know that's <laughs> we've we've got a, a lot of uh, lack of intelligence on our team, I guess, to get to where we have. <laughs> Wait a minute, what you say? <laughs> I've been I've been following you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's, that's there you go right there. If you're talking about what makes a good team, there it is right there. And, and I'm not I'm not trying to toot our own horns, but that's part of it right there. That that uh, we can do that, and it doesn't. It, it's all good. Okay, we have a statement comment. What do you say? Oh, he just says, uh, absolutely. One of the games I played at my first uh, Aussie Open uh, that I learned the most was uh, playing Kelvin Kirko in the men's pairs. Got crushed 34-6, to six, but learned so much, and it pushed me to work hard to where I could get um, to that top level. So, That's Man, pretty good. I'd, he got six I'd, shots I'd be against happy to score six that's, shots that's, against Kelvin, too. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, especially on those that's games. That's a victory too. for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a wow. good point too because like everybody has those games like if if i go back uh to like when i played in the juniors when i was really young i'd go up against guys like uh at the time i guess who were were big in the sport it'd be like the trevor whites uh the malcolm whites were there when i first started and those were guys i was kind of afraid of and if i went up against them on the green i would just get slaughtered and uh, uh but Every time I went out there, I wanted to beat them so bad that I put everything I had into each bowl. Whether I won or lost, it was still something I took away from each game. Is there? Is there? Is there here's a question for all of you because you're all competitive in your own way. What is there a game that you went? I'm here. I got it. Like like before it started. Well, the kind of game that you know you've now turned the corner and, and now you're going to be you're you're, you're going to challenge or even win. It's a good question. Yeah, like me thinking back, like I guess the first Canadians that we won was 2011 in uh, Willowdale. Leapfrog. And yeah, the leapfrog gear. <laughs> yeah. And I, I can remember we were playing, I guess it was the Roths were the Forest team from Ontario. And there was a, an end where I think we went back and forth. Each team made about three or four shots. And I think my brother called me to play sort of a three-weight shot and very finicky shot. And I made the shot. And then John buried it in the ditch or something. And we scored five or something. And that was a big turning point. I remember just sort of after we scored that five, that was kind of my moment where I was like, okay, we're all playing good. We're playing together. Uh, I guess, as David said, it's the moment where you just kind of thought, okay, we've got this. Like, yeah. I'm even I'm even thinking taking it back, not even in an, in an event, but your own personal game where you mm. went, I, I, I think I've, I'm where I want to be. Now it's up to, you know, just, you know, good bowls or, 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 or whatever to, to take it to the next level. Um, that's kind of where I was kind of talking about hey, it's some tournaments. Of course, there is a moment where, you know, this is it um, for, for, for me, I've, Two moments. Talk about an event. Our, our game against when we when Steve and I first started playing fours. The first year we played provincials, and our our we made to the final, and we played Ryan Bester, and we talk about quick games versus long games. It was a four and a half hour marathon <laughs> of fours on an eight or nine second green which may be the best game I've ever seen in my entire life because every single bowler on the green was bowling brilliantly and had weight control that was, you know, you, you dream for. And, and 
even though we lost that game and and it was only only we the extra end was killed twice before we lost uh we oh we got something here so i knew the team was was good at that point but from a personal note it was very weird because i'm playing in a fours tournament in 1991 and and i threw a bowl and i went i felt that and i felt it to the point where I had control over the ball. Just it's it, you know it's, it's kind of weird just to talk about it because it's a personal thing, but um, that's when I knew that I had a chance. And it took a while before you see the results you're looking for, but at least you feel that you're you're uh, in the game kind of thing. I think uh, Dave, I think I uh, kind of understand what you're what you're trying to get at here. Um, and for me personally, I'm going to say no. I've never felt like I've made it to that spot. Yeah, I've won some stuff, but I've never, never really reached the top plateau of where I feel like I could be. Uh, I feel like I'm, me personally, I'm just right at that that corner where I need to turn turn the corner, and then the rest of it is kind of in that spot. Uh, I think I've been really close, but no, I don't think I've ever made it to the point where I thought, yeah, yeah, we're here. That's totally. Yeah, right. I, I think I, I think uh, I think you probably turn more than one corner if you if you really want to get better. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, the uh, the adage that I, I I like to take is is uh, you know we I, I lost the provincial final twenty two times before I won it. So if you if you didn't look at some of the victories before that as turning the corner, you probably give up a long time before that. I would have committed suicide. <laughs> it's persistence, a lot of losses. Yeah, but can, but Steve, pre, pre, uh, pre, preface that by saying a lot of times it was the first bull you picked up, you won your district, went on to the Canadian uh, uh, provincial final, and you had not bowled anything until that point. Many, many times. Yeah. I, I'll say that you won't. I'll say that I won't. <laughs> I can say probably for me, um, I didn't really feel like I had something going until my first provincial win, which was the triples, and that was when we went to Willowdale. Um, we ran the table and didn't win the gold. We lost on tiebreaker. That's a tragic story of my life. But um, yeah, we have to have a chat about that game again. <laughs> it, that. <laughs> That weekend, it wasn't a specific game, but that weekend just was like a bubble for me where it was like, um, like I know what shot I want to play. I know how to play it. It's quick greens, really uh, level. Everything's going where I want it to go. Um, I can visualize. I can, everything just seemed to click all at once. It was just like, here's all the things I've been practicing, and it was just like Tetris. Fit, everything kind of fit into place, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, my God things are things are happening um and from that point i think for me it's just been um building on that where now i think i have a really good eye for team building and the players that i pull into play with myself rather than before all fit nicely so that it, it's like a cohesive unit but um that's probably the only spot that i can really feel that I was cognizant that it was like, holy crap, things are just starting to fall together. Yeah. Um, I just got a, a question here for, I guess, uh, Mike, you can answer this one too, but it's going to be more based towards everybody else. Um, what do you guys think um, if for somehow we got the funding and a uh, indoor facility was open somewhere in Ontario um, where it was possible? What do you think that does for the sport? Do you think it... Um, keeps the numbers about where they are for membership wise, or do you think it uh, uh, balloons and we get a few more people or like, what do you, what do you think happens uh, with something like that? Can you be more specific? How big is this indoor? How good is this indoor? Is it but, like, where is well, this indoor? Uh, let's just say it's in, I guess the best case scenario, it's in the GTA somewhere and it's uh, eight, eight ranks to green. I think it would help 
maybe a little bit of exposure in the GTA, but I don't think it would help the sport overall as a whole, the way that some people think it would. And I think it also depends on who's running it because I've seen so many clubs that are just so poorly managed that if it's the same people running it, then it's just going to fall in the hole too. So I think it depends a lot on who's actually running it, who's promoting it, but no matter who it is, I still don't think it's actually going to save the sport. I think it would maybe just give a small bubble to the GTA and they might have, you know, another 500 members, but that's my thought. Well, I mean, we have, we have an example in, in BC has the, how much has the BC indoor and maybe we aren't, able to answer that question but has the indoor in bc made that much of a difference in bowls in bc i'm not saying it hasn't i just don't know yeah i i don't know either dave uh, I'm, I'm i've never lived in bc so i'm not really sure on like what the polls like i just think uh me personally, if there was something that was like centralized in as big of a draw as Ontario is for bowls, just how many uh, members we have, I think something centralized definitely has the opportunity to be something uh, something big and help the sport. But like Jake said, yeah, if it's mismanaged and the marketing's not there, it's just going to be a total waste of money. I think if you had a 16 rink indoor where you got to a point where you could actually host national championships there, you could host international events there like the NAC or uh, invite Scotland over or whatever, then you could actually maybe increase exposure a little bit more. But with an eight rank, I don't think you can really do much with that. I, I don't think the indoor in BC has made much of an impact in Ontario, for example. So not it, at all. It, yeah, not at all. Yeah. So I, I, I'd be curious to know what BC people might think in terms of has it helped. Obviously, you get the chance to bowl in the in the winter, um, but it's not every single bowler. It's just a group of bowlers that play in the in the in the winter as well. So it's only if, only going to help a few people in that respect. I, I, I don't know. I'm I'm speaking without knowledge, so I'm just tongue in cheek about it all. I don't know. I don't know. I guess, need someone from BC to say that. To answer I that. guess uh, going against my own point, I think you really need um, an indoor in every province with bowlers <laughs> to really have to really have a massive impact. So then there's some sort of like indoor circuit. It's the just like if you thing in, in the States, what is it? $580 million. That would work. Yeah, that would work. With that. I just uh, I just think if you look at it, um, whether if we have an indoor here and an indoor in BC, um, it's never going to be what we want it to be unless it's everywhere. Because like uh, statistically looking at if you see the indoor champions and stuff, it's all basically BC with the exception of a few people here and there. So I think if we need it to be if it's ever going to be something big, I think it's got to be everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure from a from an overall bowl standpoint. One indoor is going to make a difference in the overall membership. I think where it where it has the big positive influence is as long as it's a good quality surface, you're going to improve the play at the high level, for sure. Yeah, and I, James McGowan just said that indoor in BC has only impacted the quality of bowling, not the membership, really. So. Yeah, yeah. and I think I think uh, Malcolm's right. Um, I, a lot of people have said this for a long time, and it's just never really uh, come come forward. But uh, I think he's right. In my opinion, is growing the sport in Canada has a lot to do with friends. He says beer, music, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think I think that's great. And then having a bar at most clubs definitely drives revenue and helps clubs keep going, even especially the smaller ones. Um, but yeah, I think that I think that's got to be the biggest way to to get things going is some sort of fun uh, music, almost like a just like a get together instead of a bowls event. I think basically is what's going to grow the sport. Well, to be honest, all of us here, why do we play bowls? Yes, there's a certain competitive part of it, but we we want to play and and be with our friends and have a good time with our friends. So Malcolm is spot on when it comes to what would make the sport better. And you know, I, I, we all. W most of us have had an opportunity to see stuff like barefoot bulls in Australia. I mean, I went to Broad Beach, and, and I know other people have been there. And Ryan told me it's free money. They show up. They spay, spend 10 bucks for renting bulls. They play for a few ends. They bring five, six, eight, ten people with them. Then they sit in a bar. And they sit in a bar for a couple hours, and that's their, their evening out. And, and, you know, and you get some membership out of that. Um, but the exposure of bulls on a fun level is is huge in that respect when you have those kind of things happening. Do you think uh, 
Do you think if Bowles was cons- uh, more uh, looked at as a business here and was open um, during regular hours, do you think people in Canada would walk off the street and try the sport um, for fun and then have a couple beers after? Or is that just because it's so normalized in Australia? No, I think I think they would. You know, I play at a, a club in the middle of a park. It's like two clubs in the middle of a park. And uh, I, th- I think it would be a huge draw. <laughs> Yeah, the, the number of people you stand and talk to at the edge of the at the edge of the green that are interested in it would be drawn in substantially more if it was a a local place to gather. If local you, place to gather, yes, I like that. Yeah. If you really uh, limit the fences and the uh, just the the quietness and restrictions that you have, sort of around typical clubs, if you can kind of limit that, if you have music playing. You have some sort of beer tent. I don't know what you call it, but some sort of advertising music playing. You're probably going to get a lot more people who have that curiosity to maybe come in inside and ask you more than just a question. Maybe stop for a beer, play some barefoot bulls, whatever it might be. I think it's you got to sort of change the mentality of a lot of clubs and the restrictions that exist. Definitely. And the hours and their being available is a big problem. It's a good point, Mike, because like if you look at... um our sport over the years, if there was something like that going on, it was basically the people who were deemed, uh, quote unquote, like alcoholics or bad people in the sport because they're out there trying to have a good time rather than it actually being a business and bringing people into the sport to have fun. Yeah. I did, I did a little exercise with a, with a club in the West End of Toronto that was that had a total of four members at it who went out and played every week on the same day on the same green. The green ran about five seconds. But the interesting part about the club was that it had in total about 7,000 members actually because every member of the community that that green was in was deemed to be a member. Um, we, we held a, a social event and uh, it was interesting. I think we had 100 people show up to the social event and uh, I think that club just joined the uh, Ontario Association this year. They hadn't been a member of the association for over 50 years. What club was that, Steve, if you don't mind me asking? Babby Point. Okay. Yeah. I, I they probably still don't have, you know, in reality, they don't have they don't have more than probably 40 or 50 members, but that's 10 times the number they had 3 or 4 years ago. And they still run their Friday night socials two or three times a year and still get big numbers out. So I think it, I think that's, you know, the type of thing we need to do a lot more of, you know, if you gave a free membership to everybody in, in the area and two of those events, you you might find, you might find you, you had a lot more, at least understanding of the game, if nothing else. Well, if you look at it, Steve, let's compare it to something else. Like the the neighborhood that I live in, it's a, a newer subdivision in the last, let's just say, 10 or 15 years. And what it opened at the same time, the golf course right over here opened. And they gave everybody who bought a house in this subdivision a free membership for a year to the golf course. Now it's the most private and biggest golf course in the city. So, like, the model definitely works. Yeah. Yeah. The, mo- the model works. And, you know, in a lot of ways, our memberships are almost free anyway. Uh yeah. It wouldn't be a significantly bigger loss to uh, just give everybody one. It's part of your taxes. <laughs> yeah, I, I like I like Cameron's comment. His club jumped in membership by huge numbers because of the social part. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it's amazing. That, and it, it, it's not a surprise that clubs that have real bars are among the bigger clubs and more popular clubs because it's all about social well and like dave we've talked about this in the for, uh, before on the show uh who wants to go inside and drink uh, coffee and tea at uh seven o'clock at night why wouldn't we go inside and have a beer correct uh, amen Hey, Mike, I'll throw this one at you. You've uh, you've been at a club who's tried to expand uh, the social aspect outside of the uh, competitive side uh, with the B-Cubed thing that you guys have going on there. Uh, do you think uh, that uh, event that you have uh, really helps drive membership? Or, like, did people that aren't members show up? How does that work? Um, like, 
they ran it they ran it for the one year and this year kind of was really unfortunate because they they really had built a good uh a good program there with b cubed but we did have i think it was four or five of those b cubed members joined as full-fledged members uh the following year so like five out of I think we had 12 teams times four. Like, it's not a spectacular number, but all of those people showed up. Uh, they were there for multiple hours. They bought food because we did food beforehand. They bought drinks. And about half of those teams, or just over half of those teams, joined for a second year. So, although they're not paying like our full membership fee, it's a partial membership fee. And they're still there supporting the club in that aspect for the more social aspect, which is a good aspect for us. But then, a few of those people kind of trickle through as your full members. So as long as you have that, I guess, format in place where you are inviting people in, getting them there to experience it, you're going to kind of have a trickle effect of a few full fledged members, but then you're also going to get um, the more social members, which are also very important as well. You've talked about it a few times, Luke, on some of your shows about how clubs should be ran like a business, and I agree wholeheartedly, but how do you see us getting to that model? Um, this year, I've finally started to step up and try to help out my club here in St. Catharines a bit, but seeing how few people want to actually volunteer and help and seeing how much work needs to actually be done, it's like super overwhelming to even just think about how much needs to happen. So how do you see all the clubs in Canada moving to more of a business instead of just a, I'll volunteer once a week and consider it my job like, done. If okay, I'm so, going to jump right in, like the Canada summer jobs, uh, they allow you to essentially get a person to come in and be your coordinator. So our club for years struggled to have somebody that could be there for social bowlers or group bookings. And we hired two students uh, through, it's a student, a grant you get from the government of Canada uh, where you can literally have these students come in and be workers for you for the year. And the government covers uh, it's about 50% of the wages, I believe. So we did that, and that was a huge help for us this year, kind of getting as much as we could out of this year with COVID. But we had the the two students come in, and that was a huge thing because it definitely turned into more of a business. We had a lot more input from, uh, I guess, our social groups because of it. That's a great question, Jake. And I think um, just based off my own personal knowledge being uh, from Ontario, I think uh, if it was to ever happen in Ontario where we got from the point of being a, um, a lawn bowling club to a business, I think um, in Ontario we would have to consolidate clubs because um, I think um, unfortunately – there's a little bit of oversaturation in the uh, in the space of uh, small clubs. So there's so many clubs that are relatively close together, but there's I don't I don't want to throw a number out there, but there's so many. In my opinion, there's more clubs that are uh, dying or struggling to stay alive than there are thriving. And I think just because there's so many clubs in so like relatively close areas, I think if we're ever going to turn it into a business. Um, they would have to have bigger clubs in larger areas rather than smaller clubs in more areas, uh, if that makes sense. I know um, if we're looking at it from growing the sport standpoint, that might not work um, just because you're going to have the people who don't want to drive 20 minutes, half an hour to a club. Um, but if you're looking to make it a business, I think that's the best way to do it and trying to grow something bigger in a larger area. Oh, there's there's tons of clubs in Ontario. You know, good good point. Tons of clubs in Ontario that, you know, their membership fees are so low that they can't build on their property. They can't have better greens. They can't expand their clubhouse. There's a lot of things they can't do because they have no revenue to do it. However, they think that if you increase the fees by from fifty dollars to sixty dollars, you're going to lose half the membership, and maybe they might lose some. Um, I know. Uh, for example, uh, when I was on the board in, uh, for OBA a bunch of years ago, uh, there was a club up in central Ontario that had to withdraw from being part of OLBA because they had to get their kitchen sink fixed and they couldn't afford to do both. 
because and as as it turned out, we decided to do a, a little survey on on membership fees, and their membership membership fees were twenty dollars a year. And when you take away what goes to OLBA and Bowls Canada, there wasn't a lot of money left over. And there probably it was like 15 or 20 members. And there's so many clubs that are fit that category where th- their membership fees are so low, there's no money for them to do anything. And, and uh, I think those clubs need to amalgamate and, and maybe make more super clubs, shall we say, as opposed to a bunch of small clubs that have, you know, five to 10 to 15 to 20 members. I think that that would help the cause a lot. And I, think it, I think it definitely, be that better. I think it definitely matters, Dave, in, uh, in cities such as uh, just what off the top of my head, like in Toronto or in uh, Kitchener or I don't even know where else places that have more than one club. Um, Cause a lot of the times there's the one dominant club and then there's another dying club or in the Toronto where I, again, I don't, I don't really know. I'm not, I'm not super versed on numbers of clubs, but I just feel like if uh, there was a possibility of eliminating the smaller clubs, selling the property, if they own it and uh, just kind of consolidating, I think it, it, it uh, definitely ups the odds of having that club grow and having the membership uh, be where it needs to be, to be able to afford things. Yeah, like Saskatchewan. Uh, I, I, like in Saskatchewan, we had a similar situation about a decade ago. Saskatoon uh, tried to amalgamate all of their clubs, and one of the clubs was in a prime time location right down the river in Saskatoon. If you've ever been there, it's a beautiful location. They folded uh, about three or four years ago because one of the clubs in Saskatoon refused to amalgamate because they wanted to be independent, do their own thing. And two of the three were in, in on it, but then the city made a, uh, I guess, at a point that all three clubs had to be in on it in order for it to happen. So it's one of those. Mo- I think you're going to run into a lot of problems getting clubs to do a model like that. We're going to say no. We we want it. We've done it this way for 116 years or however long their history might be. But then you're going to have you're going to struggle with it because I I think it it works and it would be great to have that club if they had done it downtown saskatoon they would have had an artificial and two grass greens as the promise but again you're going to struggle to get some older fuddy duddies to uh to get in there on that what do you think uh steve you look like you got something to say about this topic (laughs) so here we go (laughs) (laughs) well you know most most of the clubs in toronto are municipally owned so um and quite often municipally maintained. So the you know it's it's difficult to force an amalgamation when you're when you really don't you know the the city would be more than happy to say okay shut down the club because it's costing them money and they turn it back into parkland. Uh, but would you gain anything anywhere else? That's that becomes part of part of the question. I think I think economy of scale in toronto maybe we should have four clubs maybe um we've got a lot more than four clubs yeah Um, so you know if you were looking at it by the numbers if you had to pay your greenskeeper and and uh you know run a facility there wouldn't be the number of clubs that there are for sure um and i don't think i don't think we're unique from that standpoint i think there's a lot of municipally run clubs and uh and with fees certainly not coming anywhere close to inflation i think if you looked at we did we did a little exercise on our club and and i think when i joined um at at the club that i'm at now i think green fees were were something like or something like 65 or 70 dollars for the year um so they doubled in 50 years that's certainly not what inflation is <laughs> right no jay so, no jake oh sorry go ahead steve yeah so you, you can't really expect to have a facility that's that's going to be as good as what it was then even right now jake you asked you asked the question uh you being the bulls canada guy what do you what do you see <laughs> best, best best fit for that uh, I'd agree with Mike that summer students are, are key. Um, I think that clubs do need to get paid staff because what we're asking volunteers to do is frankly unreasonable and has been for years. And now it's just come to the point where there's not enough 
not enough volunteers to keep doing what we're asking them to do. So I think paid staff is really the only way out of this. And most clubs aren't going to be able to afford paid staff at all. So if they can get a summer student in to help build up the membership a little bit, then, you know, five, 10 years from now, maybe they'll actually be at a point where they can hire a club manager to actually go out and market the club and keep it open That's a good 10 hours, 12 hours a day. Um, but the tough part is that you have to convince existing club members to do that and from my experience that's probably the toughest sell because so many club board members are um not willing to change i guess is the best way i can phrase that so if i were to go into probably like nine out of ten clubs in canada right now and say hey can you go and hire a summer student they'd probably say absolutely not so that's that's the tougher part to fixing all of this is how do you convince people something's good for them when they don't want to believe it don't want to change and i i don't have an answer for that i have no idea you're right jake like change is definitely tough to put into the the minds of some people like just uh myself and peterborough when we switched from our little crappy clubhouse with three greens that had nine bowlers on them on a tuesday night for our jitneys or whatever when they decided to merge with a senior center and we had the the fantastic club host that we have today and two greens that we can fill every week for our tournaments. We had a uh, numerous amount of uh, club members leave the club for that reason. Um, so yeah, I can, I, I understand what you're saying there. Is there, is there anything we can do as from an association standpoint to hire the students to provide that to the, to the clubs? It, it's funny you bring Who that up. We're in the middle of, yeah. We're in the middle of making our plans for next fiscal right now. Um, yeah. And so we're actually talking about what we can do to further help clubs with that. Is there something we can do? And it's, it's tricky because as, as you touched on, like some clubs are municipally run, municipally owned and some are privately owned, privately run. And some are just a weird combination of both. So there's not an obvious one size fits all. But we are having that discussion to see what can we do to help out clubs. And, and a lot of clubs to still don't like OLBA, don't like BCB, don't like their provincial association, what have you. So we're never going to get all clubs on board with this. But even if we just got, I don't know, like 10 to 20 clubs to get a yeah. summer student, hopefully it would be good and word would spread. And then next year it'd be like 30 or 40 and then just snowball from there. But it's it, it's being discussed. I don't know if anything will necessarily come of it right away, but that's sort of a goal of, of mine anyway, is to get at least a couple of clubs. Because Mike, you said yours uses summer students. I know that New Brunswick which is surprising. There's a couple clubs in New Brunswick that use summer students and have for years. So there's definitely clubs out there that are already doing it. Send out another survey, Jake. Get that information from everyone. <laughs> I, I, I'm cognizant of how many surveys we've sent out between Anna and I. I think we've sent out probably like over 10 surveys in the past three months. So like we're kind of like we don't want to survey people out because there's there's a lot. <laughs> Like I said at the beginning, there's, we're not doing anything. Send them out. We can we can give you more information to help you do your jobs. Yeah, I guess now's the time if you want to send out a lot. No, there's no time that's better. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot of bigger clubs across the country. And I, obviously, I'm, I'm talking about Ontario when I say it. But I'm sure there's bigger clubs across the country that would benefit immensely from having a summer student to kind of look after the day-to-day -day operations of the club and leave the, the club members to actually enjoy themselves instead of feeling the pressure of having to run the club too. I, I, I think that's an excellent idea to try and, try and get summer students in clubs. When I was at the indoor singles the last time we ran it, I talked to some people who were there watching and it turns out that they run the biggest club in Canada out in BC. They have like I don't know, 300 and some odd members. And they more than doubled, maybe even tripled like overnight from just running an LGBTQ league that just brought in like 200 new members overnight. And like, that was just the biggest shock to them. Cause they were like, how do we train more than double what we've ever had? Like, how do we even teach them how to play, let alone like function. And so then now with 300 members, they're like, we have a lot of money coming in, but we don't really know what to do with it because we've never had this problem before so I, I talked to them a lot and it was kind of interesting to hear how having so many members can actually be a problem if you're not ready for it um yeah. so i think you're right there are some big clubs out there that would definitely benefit from having a summer student or a paid staff member to actually run the club for them it's like my experience with us finally getting the uh paid i guess member was 
we had so many people that I guess don't want to do the behind the scenes paperwork per se. And if you get that summer student, they're going to do that paperwork because it's their job when you can easily get a member out there to teach someone to lawn bowl because it's something they like to do. They like to be out there. They like to teach people. It's a lot easier to get someone to come out maybe once or twice to do something like that rather than sit behind a desk or a computer and have to file paperwork or whatever you want to do to to get it to work, I guess, behind the scenes. Yeah, good point. Okay, Jake, you're on. This is uh, a <laughs> change of sport. Before 2021 is over, change the sport all by yourself. Let's do it. <laughs> Easy peasy. No right? pressure, by the way. No pressure. <laughs> I'll do that once you uh, get COVID finished so we can start bowling in April. And- uh, I'm doing my best, buddy. <laughs> I'm keeping my bubble small. I moved my bubble. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> I How do you think COVID's going to impact your clubs this year? Just throwing it out there. I think that uh, it's going to affect it more than last year because I personally don't think anything is going to change from last year to this year. And I think more people are going to be fed up with wanting to uh, not do anything. And I think less people are going to support their clubs than last year. Mm. Doom and gloom guy. Mm. Don't disagree, actually. (laughs) Yeah, it's going to be tough until we have enough people that can't get COVID. Uh, to 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 start back up again this year, but it should be uh, should be an opportunity to start to think about what we're going to do when we're back up for sure. I'm going to be glass half full and think that this is probably like the biggest opportunity that we've had since I've been bowling right now because right now we're probably the only sport outside of golf that we can say we've like we never had a single case last year that I know of, and so a lot of clubs ran safely last year with. The protocols in place so now is like the biggest op- marketing opportunity after everyone's been cooped up all winter to be like hey come try this new sport because it's safe and you can be outside well you, 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 you nailed it on the head again jake uh kenny our president of milton lombolding club um that's how he's marketing the sport for for 2021 it's come come play in a safe sport uh we have all the protocols in place and no one's got sick so we've done something right so i think that's an an excellent uh um uh angle to to pursue when it comes to bowls and the general public and 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 how to promote it excellent yeah yeah i know a lot of clubs ran at a deficit uh, they got a lot of member support, but probably not as much as they expected. But um, whether the majority of those clubs can continue to run at a deficit and maintain what they have, that's that's going to be the big question. Who's who's going to actually take advantage of it and try to push forward? And who's going to just go with the status quo and maybe not make it? Yeah, like, not to be the doom and gloom guy again, but I think this could be a dagger in the heart of a lot of the kind of fringe clubs this year where last year wasn't good they kind of made it work but i think this year continuing again if it's the same thing as last year and we don't kind of have the opportunity to at least attract some people out there maybe play some tournaments get the extra revenue i think it could be a dagger to a lot of the the mid-level and struggling clubs yeah, I really, I really hate to agree with you, Mike. But like I said before, I just think it's going to be tough. I think it's going to be tough for a lot of the smaller clubs to stay alive. Yeah, especially like even especially the ones that were struggling even when there was no COVID. Yeah. Oh, if they're struggling before COVID, this is not going to help the cause at all, for sure. I think Jake, you had a good point before, where well, it might have been Jake or Mike, or it could be an MA, but um, it's the same. It's the same issue we have with just growing the sport and staying alive who's willing to make the changes and look for something different to actually help themselves out make the changes find a new avenue to generate or if you if you're so rooted in tradition and stuck in the mud where you're not gonna change for anybody or anything that might be your downfall kind of thing I've been doing a lot of research now that I actually have time to to do research and not just worry about championships, about all the clubs in Canada. And something like 75% of clubs have a website, but like 25% don't. 
And of the ones that do, my next step is I want to look to see, do they actually have like hours that shave when they're open? Because a lot of research shows that like when you watch a commercial, when you find something new, the first thing you do is you Google it and find out more about it. But if you don't have a website, then like you're not going to find anything. And a lot of clubs just have like a Facebook page. But if I've never heard of Bulls before and I go and I Google your club, I don't know what a Jitney is. So that doesn't really tell me much. And if you don't have like what hours you're open on, then that doesn't really help me much either. And so I'm probably just going to close the page and say, well, that was useless. Not going to look into that any further. So it's, it's kind of interesting this year now that I actually have time to do research to find out where clubs are struggling, where clubs do need help so I can hopefully make a plan to help them going forward. That's a good, uh, you, that's a good point. Time, time of operation. Yeah, <laughs> simple as that. <laughs> you did speak about Jitney, Jitney's, Jake, but how many clubs do we know in Canada that even have a time of operation at all? Like, how many clubs are open when there's no members on the green? I, I'm going to guess maybe zero. <laughs> zero. <laughs> uh, sorry, I guess, I guess I know Pacific Indoor used to have somebody there all the time, but I don't know about any other clubs in the country that all that had anybody like that ever. Well, a lot of clubs still have, like, league nights or whatever, so you could even say just, like, league nights are Tuesday from 7 to 9 or whatever. At least, like, someone's going to be there for the club to be open, right? Or a jitney or whatever, for sure. Yeah, or or come and try the game, you know. Wednesday of uh, every Wednesday for the first month of the season or something like that. Mm-hmm. Well, gentlemen, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna hop in here and say we've been going for an hour and a half. Believe it or not. <laughs> Time flies when you're having did, fun. Is, is anybody watching us, though? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we still got at least 21 viewing at the moment. Uh, Daryl, Daryl, just before I let you wind this down, I have a question for the panel, just because I, I, I preach this every single time on our live shows, and I barely ever get any feedback. Uh, Dave, <laughs> Steve, Mike, and Jake, who do you want to see as the next guest on the regular edition of the Canadian Bowler podcast? Hmm. Put us on the spot, eh? Hey, I guess. <laughs> well, for me, just from a colorful individual that has uh, opinions from a different perspective that, that we might have, uh, Patrick, De, uh, never say his last name, Patrick from Quebec, De, Des. Sorry, Durama. Patrick, if you're watching. Can't, can't, never did say your name properly. Um, he would be excellent, uh, partly because he's he's bright-eyed and bushy-tailed when it comes to watching bowls at a, at a top level, um, and 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 I think his opinions are very honest and and uh, not as jaded as maybe some of our opinions are. <laughs> I think he might be an ex and he, 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 he would be honored to do something like this as an ex- you know just a, a name out there. Perfect. I, I, I might like to see a prominent politician on. Oh <laughs> get somebody get somebody that get somebody that controls the purse strings. All oh. right uh, Dar- everybody every, everybody share this one to Doug Ford. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking more of I was thinking more of John Tory. Oh, John Tory. Okay. Yeah. That's not bad from a Toronto perspective. Yeah, it's it, well, and you know he he did have a prominent place in provincial politics, and his parents lawn bowled. All right, that okay. is going on the list. <laughs> if I were to throw my two cents in there, I was going to sort of go the direction of what Steve is saying there, but somebody who's more from like a marketing perspective or that aspect of the world, uh, and not necessarily involved with bulls, but someone who's maybe marketed a different sport or been involved with other sports and growth potentially. Uh, it'd be interesting to kind of get a perspective of what worked for them, ideas that we could maybe try and incorporate, marketing, something yeah. like that. Great Good idea. idea. Yeah. What about what about Derek, Daryl, Derek McKee? Yeah, I know he's not a marketing guy, but he's got some experience at a pretty high level when it comes to sports. Yeah, we could definitely. Uh, I mean, he liked the stream, so he was probably watching for a little bit. If he's not watching still, so 
Derek, yeah, just yeah. keep your ear to the ground. Islands. <laughs> Shout out, Derek. Yeah. Yeah. Jake doesn't want to see anybody again. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know. I'm I'm torn. I'd, I'd probably follow Mike's sentiment, but I can't think of anybody like a specific name to go for that though. So okay. I've been racking my brain to try to think of who would be a good person because I, I know some people. But um, actually, um, Sean Liebeck, he used to be the intern for BCB back in 2015, and now works for Wheelchair Basketball and worked for Rugby Canada for a little while too. He might be an interesting person just because he interned with Bulls Canada. So like he was actually at a national championship and knows the sport a little bit and oh, has wow. been with other sports. Well, Jake, if you have any contacts, don't be afraid to... Uh... <laughs> yeah. You know who I'd like to see come on and talk about Bulls? Uh, for those who've been around for a little while, Chad Possum. Jake, do you remember that name popping up? Chad Possum? I don't I don't think I've ever met him, but I remember you've told me about him. Yeah, uh, Chad Possum was amazing. Early days of his, I don't know, I, I, no, I, I can't remember what he what he's doing right now. Uh, no, he works for CBC now. Or last time I, I, I knew, he was uh, he worked for CBC. Um, but he did. I, I liked what he did for for uh, bowls at, at Canadian Championships. I liked what he did uh, for the office. I mean, and and he saw the game. Uh, you know, going back ten years ago, anyway, and maybe even longer, more than that, probably fifteen years ago. So he might be an interesting person to talk to to get some perspective of of uh, where things are going. I, I I liked him a lot. He was a good guy. Fair. Well, again, Daryl, before I let you shut this thing down, I just wanted to uh, say a uh, big thanks to Steve and Dave, a couple of legends in the sport, guys I've looked up to my whole uh, Bulls career for coming on today. And again, thanks to, to Jake and Mike for being returning guests. So thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, always fun. Oh, it, 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 like, we don't like to talk about Bulls. Give me a break. <laughs> Hey, this this is the longest show that we've had, and it didn't feel like the longest show that we had. I'll, I'll just say that it was it was nice to have all you guys on, and like Jake, uh, like uh, Luke said, it was nice to have Jake, Mike, Dave, and Steve on, and just have a casual conversation about bulls. That's what this show is all about. By the way, Derek Derek just made a comment. Oh, he's back in Ontario now. All right. Oh, there's your next guest. Get him on here. Derek, send me a message. Derek, Derek, send me a message. <laughs> Former sports rec manager with the Swift Current Broncos, Western Hockey League. There you go. Perfect guy to speak with. Yeah, he also was on. He's the, um, what was he? Uh, Derek, you can you can probably give me the right technical word for it. But he was on the Olympic Committee for uh, a country. Um, uh, a small country, but but he was on the Olympic Committee. So he, he, he knows sports well. All right. Well, everybody, I want to thank everybody for watching, everybody who tuned in. Uh, our first show of 2021 was awesome. Um, I can't thank everybody enough for everything. And uh, just to do some housekeeping, all of our links are in the description below. Don't forget to uh, follow and like our Facebook page. Don't forget to go to our YouTube page. Check out all our videos there. Uh, like and subscribe everything that you do to support this channel sharing liking uh, commenting and just viewing our content really really helps us grow and we're looking to grow again in uh, 2021 to another uh, level uh, to feed this content out to as many people as we can so with that i want to say thank you to dave steve mike and jake again and to obviously my awesome co-host uh, luke and with that May all your bulls be touchers. <laughs>